Zoravik Activist Collective welcomes you to our last Artsakh update today with Professor Asturian. Our hearts go out to those whose lives were lost in the 44 days of attacks, those whose lives were forever disrupted by this war. Many of us, me included, have been waiting to hear our update today after the massive changes to the situation in Artsakh this past week. As usual, our resident historian is Dr. Stefan Asturian of UC Berkeley. Thank you again, Professor Asturian, Stefan, for updating mm -hmm. us. I know you have many updates, so let's get started with your update from what has happened in the last week. Of course, there were many, many developments, so we expect this update to be a little longer than usual. Yes, uh, Lisa. <clears throat> Uh, as they say, uh, there is a song, uh, what a difference a day makes. Uh, this is uh, what a difference a week makes. Uh, at my, during my last update, uh, uh, that is about seven days ago, I suspect uh, I mentioned that Azeri uh, troops are very, very close to Shushi. Uh, I didn't go into the details, but there was evidence that special forces, uh, a few of them had entered uh, Sushi, Sushi at that time. Uh, well, a uh, couple of days later, actually, they took over uh, that uh, important city, both uh, symbolically important and because of its position overlooking uh, Stepanagel. Uh, uh, that's uh, what has led to this uh, truce uh, brokered mainly by Russia, but uh, with, uh, you know, Turkey on the other side and Azerbaijan on the other side. And Mr. Pashinyan uh, had uh, to sign it. Now, let's look at Assuming uh, this uh, arrangement is implemented over the next approximately uh, two weeks, this is what is going to happen. And uh, allow me uh, to use share screen to show some maps. Uh, just a second, please. You see the situation is uh, this, this area here is the area that uh, the Azerbaijani troops and uh, with Turkish help uh, have conquered, including Shushi. Now, uh, by November uh, the 15th here, the area of Kelbajar, this area, will have to be returned to Azerbaijan. By November the 20th, this area here uh, with Magdagerd Agdam, uh, but uh, Magdagerd is, uh, will remain part of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, this yellow area will have uh, to be returned to Azerbaijan. And then uh, by December the 1st, here, this area, approximately north of the Lachin Corridor, this yellow area, uh, will have to be uh, returned to Azerbaijan. Uh, this is what uh, is projected if this agreement is implemented. And in addition to this area, yellow with uh, green stripes uh, that were lost, lost by the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, troops and Armenian troops, this territory to the north also with green stripes over the yellow background uh, was also uh, lost. Here you see the two corridors that will be uh, created uh, in part or as a whole. 
a Lachin corridor, but it won't go anymore to Shushi, since Shushi is now uh, Azerbaijani uh, territory. Uh, that road, uh, probably with modifications along the way, will have to be built uh, and go straight uh, to Stepanagerd. Uh, previously, it, uh, it came very close to Shushi, so now that's uh, excluded. And uh, in the south, uh, there will be a road to be built between the Azerbaijani exclave of uh, Nakhichevan and what is projected to be mainland Azerbaijan after the territorial losses in this war, that is the south of Azerbaijan here. This road doesn't exist, so it will have to be built. And both roads uh, will come, will be uh, basically under the control of Russian peacekeepers. So let's stop these and go to the next map uh, where I will show you where the Russian peacekeepers uh, are located. Yeah, I just saw the message now. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me see if I can return to the previous one, uh, since apparently I had to zoom on it. Maybe you don't see it well. Uh, uh, which map was it? Uh, I think it was this map here. Uh, so how do you zoom on these? Uh, if you press command and then the plus sign next to the delete. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see command. Where is the command thing here? Uh, it might be um, control for you. Oh, uh, control and the plus. Ah, yeah. Yeah. There it is. So now it's too much, maybe. <laughs> no, no, it's good. So basically, to repeat what I have said, uh, in case uh, you couldn't see the map appropriately, uh, various territories were lost. These are the territories with uh, green stripes over a yellow background. So the whole south here, including Shushi. Yeah? This is Iran, of course, here. To the north, this territory and uh, a small bit of territory here. Uh, let me try to diminish it a little bit. Maybe we'll see it better. Yeah, this little piece here is gone. Uh, by November the 15th, all this Kelbajar area here is supposed to be returned to uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, by November the 20th, this area with Agdam in the south, Mardagerd, which will remain uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, this yellow area will have to be returned to Azerbaijan. And finally, by December the 4th, uh, the, the 1st, sorry, all the area north of the Lachin corridor and south of the Kelbajar area that uh, had to be returned earlier will be returned to Azerbaijan. And I believe for the two corridors, it was quite uh, uh, clear when I mentioned them. There is no need to repeat that. Now, uh, where will the Russian peacekeepers be located? Uh, a lot of them are already there. Uh, so let's look at the peacekeepers here. Here they are. So every single one of those uh, uh, red triangles uh, with a pinkish color in, uh, inside uh, is a location for the Russian uh, peacekeepers. They have divided the area into a southern and uh, northern area. Hmm? Uh, this is the southern area. This is obviously the northern area. That doesn't take a genius. Uh, and uh, you see here peacekeepers in these places, uh, they totally control the Lachin uh, 
corridor and uh, they are also going to uh, control uh, the road from uh, Nahichevan to uh, mainland Azerbaijan, that is the newly uh, conquer conquered territories uh, in the south. So I hope this was uh, clear to all of you. I will uh, uh, stop sharing and there will be uh, a control center, a monitoring control center located in uh, Azerbaijan itself. And apparently, uh, Turks are also going to be part of that uh, uh, control uh, center, but it won't be in uh, Karabakh, and it seems to be separate from the peacekeepers, hmm? because Turkey has tried to claim that uh, it will bring in peacekeepers. Uh, Russians are denying it, but in the agreement, there is the fact that the control center located in Azerbaijan will be uh, created. So that's what we have got now. And the final few words about the peacekeepers. Uh, there will be about uh, 1,960 of them uh, with some military helicopters, lots of um, mm, uh, fortified vehicles, I have forgotten the technical terms. Uh, they are not tanks, but, uh, you know, lighter versions of uh, that. Okay. And the troops that have been sent are very interesting. Uh, these are not your uh, average uh, peacekeeper troops. They are also people uh, trained in uh, uh, not just keeping peace, but imposing peace in Russian. Uh, and the uh, the brigade that uh, was sent from Ulyanovsk uh, mainly is a very special elite uh, brigade of, uh, they are called riflemen, but they are paratroopers, uh, quite uh, close, uh, I mean, very, very uh, elite uh, troops. So that's an indication, that's uh, also a message. These are not, um, average soldiers from an average regiment who are there just uh, uh, to observe. The indication is that they have sent uh, very efficient fighting troops. And there are indications that the two uh, passages, corridors uh, from Nakhichevan to mainland, Azerbaijan and the Lachin corridor will be supervised by the uh, internal intelligence service. Uh, of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, the FSB. Uh, it would be uh, not exact. It's uh, it's not exactly the same as uh, uh, the FBI in the U.S. because it has border guards. It has a uh, uh, very advanced uh, uh, paramilitary troops. You know, elite elements. Uh, so, uh, yes, the FBI serves that purpose in the US, but basically the FSB uh, is uh, different. Uh, it resulted from the uh, dis di division of the KGB into two uh, in the post Soviet period be between the SVR, foreign intelligence, and FSB, uh, the internal intelligence. And we are done with the first part of this lecture, which was entitled The Truce and the Territorial uh, Changes. We are going to move to the second part of the lecture, which is unresolved problems. The main probably unresolved problem, the, the crucial unresolved problem is uh, the status of what is left of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Uh, this truce doesn't deal with that issue at all. So uh, that issue remains to be solved. 
President Aliyev gave a talk on TV. Actually, I could find it. Uh, and uh, uh, as I can understand Turkish, it wasn't too difficult to understand uh, the uh, Azerbaijan he was using. He uh, literally poked fun at uh, Prime Minister Aliyev, saying, you know, you, you, you said status, status, status. What status now? You know? Uh, so the indication on the part of Azerbaijan is that they have no intention uh, of giving any kind of status to uh, what is left of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the second issue is uh, the status of the roads, the corridors, uh, from Lachin uh, to Stepanagerd. Uh, from Nakhichevan to mainland Azerbaijan, the south of Azerbaijan. Uh, technically, uh, those roads belong to whom? Uh, on whose territory are they located? Are we, consider, uh, are we to consider uh, the territory on which the road is located to be Azerbaijani, uh, for example? Uh, internationalized, uh, what is the status? Uh, that is a little bit unclear uh, to me, but it is uh, directly under uh, Russian, uh, those two roads are under Russian uh, control. Hmm? By the way, uh, the southern one, the, between Nakhichevan and uh, uh, the south of uh, what is now mainland, uh, Azerbaijan, that road needs to be built. Uh, it doesn't exist, uh, whereas uh, I, uh, it's likely that part of the existing Lachin road, you know, will be used. And uh, instead of going to Shushi, they will have to build something going to Stepanager. Uh, the other one needs to be built, uh, and uh, it will be built most likely over the next uh, few years. That's my uh, assumption. So it's not a one day uh, business. Uh, uh, so that's another issue. An issue that uh, remains uh, to, to be, uh, <laughs> we don't know what will happen. Uh, uh, are the refugees from uh, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, some of them were evacuated just at the beginning of the war? Others were evacuated in the uh, later stage of the war. We are talking probably at this point about more than 100,000 uh, Karabakh uh, Armenians. I know at some point they gave the precise figure uh, of uh, 90,000, uh, but I know there was a second evacuation, you know, organized evacuation uh, when things got uh, really bad. Uh, the question arises uh, uh, whether uh, these people uh, will return to Karabakh, uh, will want to return to Karabakh in the current uh, circumstances. And of course, uh, uh, even if uh, quite a few of them uh, want to return to Karabakh, to what is left of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, there will be others uh, who are likely not to want to be there. Uh, and thus, there is also a refugee problem to be considered. Uh, the other side of the coin is, OK, Azerbaijan, uh, to use their language, uh, uh, liberated uh, the, uh, the territories that they conquered, you know? Uh, but uh, in those territories, there is nothing. They have been talking about their 1 million refugees. Actually, it's about 650,000. They had uh, the people who fled from there or were driven out of there uh, after the Azerbaijani military defeats uh, from 92 to 94. Uh, in order for them to return, uh, they need houses, uh, they need, uh, you know, conditions to be able to live there, and uh, there is nothing. Uh, so, uh, to what extent those people will return, when, 
uh, uh, will Azerbaijan be able to build anything there uh, is totally uh, unclear at this point, at least to me. And uh, President Aliyev has come up with the fact that uh, with the claim that now uh, uh, he is going to ask for demand actually rep reparations from Armenia, uh, you, you know, in, in the billions of dollars uh, for all the damage uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, uh, for all the damage in those regions and so on. So uh, I don't know how to interpret that. Uh, it's not anytime soon um, Armenia can pay in the tens and tens of billions of dollars. Uh, uh, that also might be a way of deflecting his own responsibility for all the rebuilding that needs to be uh, made uh, in that area. Uh, so that is also unclear. Like the Armenian case of refugees, there is that larger issue on the other uh, side of the coin. Now, the presence of peacekeepers uh, is uh, limited uh, to five years. Uh, renewable six months before the end of those five years. And uh, the point is that if one of the two sides, Armenia or Azerbaijan, refuses the renewal, uh, then they are supposed to withdraw. Uh, I don't know if uh, in four and a half years from now, Azerbaijan will want uh, those Russian peacekeepers on what it views as its own territory. On the other hand, uh, Russian peacekeepers, as I mentioned in another interview, uh, tend to be a little bit sticky. And uh, once they are somewhere, uh, you know, their uh, disappearance from that area is a little bit difficult. So we don't know also, in a nutshell, what will happen to this arrangement of peacekeepers, which is crucial uh, in four and a half years uh, from now. While we don't know what the status of what is left of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, uh, is or will be, uh, you know, as a result of that, uh, we, you know, what's the status of the existing Nagorno-Karabakh uh, government? Uh, you see, uh, there, there is also a lack of uh, clarity in that uh, regard because uh, it seems to me we are in uh, some kind of a transitional uh, period. Uh, up to now, uh, until this war, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the status of, uh, Nagorno, of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, so far as I understand, was the central problem in the negotiations carried out by the Minsk Group co-chairs, uh, France, US, and uh, Russia. This truth, however, has excluded two of those co-chairs from the arrangement the US and France, it is purely uh, Russian and on the other side, uh, Turkish Azerbaijani uh, arrangement. Okay. Uh, and now, of course, uh, the Armenian government hopes that uh, the, the issue of the status will return uh, to the Minsk Group co chairs. Uh, uh, and we shall see uh, what happens with that. At any rate, uh, if Russia agrees, and I, I get the sense that it is inclined to uh, allow that issue to, to be dealt with again by the co-chairs, but I'm, you know, I need a little bit more time to get to the bottom of that one, uh, one issue at this point. Uh, Russia has a very clear advantage. First, it brokered uh, uh, these, uh, let's call it truce. It showed that it 
it is the main player in that area. And in addition, now it has Russian troops on the ground. Uh, so its opinion will have certainly to be taken into account by uh, the US and France if the negotiating format returns uh, to that uh, Minsk group uh, co-chairs. And we are done with the second part of this uh, lecture. We are now going to go to the third part. Uh, I entitled it Winners and uh, Losers. Some of the answers are very, very straightforward and short. Uh, others are much more complicated, but I cannot devote the full time uh, to assess, for example, whether Russia is a winner or a loser. There are very divergent opinions in Russia itself uh, in that regard. Okay. Uh, insofar as the loser is concerned, it's uh, very simple. It's uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic and uh, Armenia uh, without any doubt, and there is no need for comment. You saw the maps. Uh, things are very clear. In the case of Azerbaijan, it is obviously a winner to a very great uh, extent, uh, uh, and uh, that's also uh, very uh, clear. If we take a minor player who has been only helpful to the Azerbaijanis and the Turks in the course of the whole war, allowing them to transfer material over its territory or its uh, airspace, uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia, uh, I don't think uh, my uh, in the long term might be a winner of, uh, from this arrangement. I was listening to the talk of somebody who is uh, uh, very, uh, has very good judgment, uh, uh, Mr. Eric Agopian. Uh, and uh, I saw, for example, that, uh, you know, the road that is going to be built from Nachichevan to uh, the south of uh, Azerbaijan and Nachichevan is linked also to Turkey. So now uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey are no more dependent on Georgia for uh, exportations. Hmm? Uh, Azerbaijan now will have a direct contact, uh, a territorial link with uh, uh, Turkey. And uh, that might uh, diminish uh, the role played by uh, Georgia. I mean, the, the only advantage it had over the past decade, you know, uh, of serving as a transit route uh, and not gaining much out of that, by the way. Uh, but uh, that is also something to be kept in mind. Russia. Uh, there are debates, as I said, in Russia. I, I try to follow them indirectly. Uh, I will share with you uh, my sense of the whole thing. Some people have claimed in the Western press that this is, uh, you know, uh, it shows that Russia is uh, very much diminished. It has uh, inserted Turkey now in the South Caucasus and so on. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, on the other hand, um, what you saw, the maps you saw, and the arrangement that I described uh, earlier uh, are uh, a modified version of the so-called Lavrov plan after the name of the, the last name of the foreign minister of, uh, of uh, Russia. Okay. Uh, so that plan has been realized in a way in uh, m even more negative terms from Armenia for Armenia because of the defeat. But territories are being returned. And what is crucial to Russia, what it demanded, it has demanded for many, many years. Uh, it has finally brought in its uh, peacekeepers to that area. So in that regard, uh, this is not a defeat for uh, Russia. Russia has also kept NATO and the West out of any kind of settlement and asserted its uh, primacy. 
even though it had to get involved in the typical type of antagonistic collaboration, I would call it, with Turkey. It has done the same thing in the north of Syria. It has done the same thing uh, in uh, Libya. Okay, there, the, these two know each other, have known each other for centuries. Uh, I believe they have fought more than 12 or 14 wars against one another. Uh, they are both imperial uh, uh, powers. Uh, and, um, you know, they find a modus vivendi trying to maximize their own advantages. Uh, so it has also kept the West out in a way, uh, uh, not allowing it to be a direct player in determining the current uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, in addition, it has increased its uh, leverage uh, both locally with the peacekeepers uh, and internationally, okay? Uh, if the issue of the status of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh returns to the uh, Minsk group co-chairs, uh, I would tend to think that the Russian position will be even stronger now because of its presence on the ground. Uh, uh, one has also to ask, how come this air arrangement took place at a time uh, when, uh, you know, another three or four days at most and uh, Stepanagel would fall? And the whole thing would be uh, essentially lost. Uh, why did Azerbaijan and Turkey agree to such a thing? Usually you don't stop when you have, you are close to, completing a very successful job. Now we don't know, uh, the, the, uh, we cannot prove anything, but if we try to imagine on the base of informed, uh, 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 an informed understanding of the conflict, there is only one answer, you know. Uh, there must have been something going on in the background and it is, uh, the highest likelihood is that Russia said no, no more. Eh? Uh, if not knowing Turkey, know, knowing the history of Turkey and so on, why would they stop when they have almost accomplished what, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, to put an end to uh, the existence even of, Nagorno, of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic? So I can see only one explanation, but as I said, we don't have the hard evidence at this point. So let's call it a conjecture, but not a conjecture like uh, many people I know who appear to be little Nostradamuses, you know, and talk nonsense uh, about uh, many things. Hmm? Uh, finally, uh, Turkey. Well, uh, Turkey, has achieved some of its goals. Uh, Azerbaijan is even more dependent now on uh, Turkey. Uh, it, it has inserted itself in, into the South Caucasus, which was one of its uh, goals. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it hasn't been allowed to establish its peacekeepers as peacekeepers in and around Nagorno-Karabakh, even though now it is, it is claiming that it will send peacekeepers, uh, but where is it going to send them? To Azerbaijan, if it sends them. The Russians are saying there is no such arrangement, but there is only the control center uh, away from the border of Nagorno-Karabakh. So we'll see uh, what happens, but basically they couldn't uh, do that. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, it is now even more unlikely that uh, Turkey will be part of the Minsk group co-chairs, I would tend to think. Uh, on the other hand, Turkey has achieved one of its uh, oldest uh, goals, pan-Turkist goals in a way, or uh, pragmatic goals, that is to establish direct territorial uh, link 
uh, a direct territorial link with mainland uh, Azerbaijan. So uh, basically, Turkey has been quite uh, successful without uh, any doubt, but didn't get 100% uh, of what it uh, wanted. Regarding Iran, Iran is very uh, uh, difficult but uh, to uh, understand, but basically uh, its red line was a change in the borders that affected it, and there hasn't been any uh, change. For Iran, the presence of jihadist uh, is a big no-no in that area because they are Sunni extremists, and as you know, uh, Iran is Shiite, and for those uh, jihadists, the Shiite is uh, an enemy. Uh, also, the Turkish presence now uh, uh, is not a very good piece of news for uh, Iran. Uh, however, on the other hand, uh, the fact that the West was excluded from this arrangement is uh, a plus for Iran. So mixed results for Iran, its red line wasn't crossed, and uh, that's about it. Finally, we are going to go uh, to the situation, unsettled uh, situation in Armenia, uh, with massive demonstrations and also a worrisome vandalism uh, against the, the uh, Office of the Prime Minister, the Parliament, uh, various other institutions and organizations. Uh, this is a, a difficult and sad uh, situation. Now, uh, we see there was a, a coalition of 17 parties uh, that has been formed. Uh, previously, it was 14 parties. Uh, among those uh, 17 parties, we are actually talking about three real parties. Uh, the other ones are uh, one-man shows with a club around uh, the one man. Uh, so it is deceptive to say 17. But among those 17 parties, uh, you have only one, uh, Parkavaj Hayastan, Prosperous Armenia, uh, which is represented in the parliament with, I believe, around 26 uh, seats out of a little bit more than 30. Okay. The other ones do not have uh, one deputy in the parliament. Uh, what, is, uh, what are uh, the demands of those parties? They want the resignation of uh, Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan uh, after uh, the disastrous uh, results of uh, you know, uh, this uh, war. Okay. Uh, uh, in general, uh, uh, one of the arguments, the main arguments that I am hearing uh, is uh, the argument of treason. Uh, there has been treason. Uh, that uh, is, uh, I will discuss that, but uh, prior to that, I would like to, to give you my take sitting here far away from Armenia. Uh, and uh, obviously not being privy to uh, many things I'm talking about as an academic here, you know. Uh, 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 I am trying to understand what's going on. Uh, one of the problems I can see when I look at those demonstrations, it is clear that those 17 parties have something to do with those demonstrations, but it is not to be excluded at all that part of the population that was left unprepared for this result. That has been a big mistake along the way, uh, especially after the middle of the October. Uh, uh, you know, there was a moment uh, when I was looking at geolocation, what's going, uh, what was going on. I hadn't been able to make up my mind, that is whether the Armenian army is uh, being defeated or whether, uh, yeah, it was tough fighting, but it was tactical withdrawal to higher gra grounds to better resist and attack later on and so on. Uh, by the time you reach uh, October 17th, 18th and so on, there is no doubt that 
uh, it's not just a tactical retreat, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, they are not able to face those hundreds of drones and the technology, they don't control the sky, uh, and uh, things are no good. Uh, the population, uh, except perhaps a few people who really know where to look and so on, were, uh, were not prepared for uh, the fact that the things are going poorly. And I suspect that uh, some of the protesters, uh, you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe many, I don't know. Uh, they, they are not just uh, people affiliated with those parties, but also people who are enraged, who just uh, are in a state of shock, uh, like a lot of people in the diaspora I know. Uh, and uh, they find the whole thing intolerable. Uh, and so, so. However, there is something I would like to say. I, I haven't spent much time to watch uh, the dozens of videos of those demonstrations and so on, but I, I, I took a look at a few of them. And uh, what is striking to me is uh, to see a lot of males, uh, actually predominantly males, uh, the, the overwhelming majority, uh, who are in the age of being at the front line at a time of general mobilization. Uh, so apparently they, are, they were not at the front line, they were in Yerevan, uh, and now they are protesting. So I don't know how the general mobilization was carried out, but uh, what I know is, is that there was supposed to be general uh, mobilization. And if I remember uh, appropriately, up to the age of 55. So I could see hundreds, literally, of people like that who should have been at the front line uh, and were actually uh, happily in Yerevan and now seem to be enraged by what happened. So there is a problem there. I don't know how to understand it. I am not there. I don't know the details of uh, how things are organized. but. At the very least, it's a little bit uh, surprising. Uh, uh, so lack of communication, has, uh, I, I think, is, uh, uh, is certainly a, a mistake, has been a mistake, uh, which has a, a price. Uh, I can see that the mobilization really, uh, you know, when you see those hundreds and hundreds of males, uh, in the streets, uh, you obviously, without even being a specialist, you ask what type of mobilization was this? Uh, so uh, there are uh, problems. Uh, I would like to look at the accusation of treason. Uh, uh, I don't know if there was treason. I, I have heard that there were spies and so on. Okay. Uh, the evidence about treason, uh, that uh, there is no solid evidence being presented to support that, with the exception of the fact that Pashinyan signed this disastrous uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's the signing that seems to be uh, the uh, treason. Uh, in this regard, uh, I, have, I could hear with my own uh, ears uh, and read also the uh, articles about it, that the chiefs of staff of uh, the army, uh, the Armenian chief of staff, the Nagorno-Karabakh chief of staff, both corroborated the fact that they uh, uh, prompted Pashinyan, you know, they told him that this is it, we... Uh, uh, continuing will be uh, disastrous and lead to uh, more uh, young and much, much older people dying. Uh, we are losing uh, the whole thing. So uh, the same position has been expressed by the president of Artsakh, Arai Kautunyan. And uh, if anybody has any doubts about those, then we can go to the current Minister of Defense, uh, uh, Tavit Donoyan. Uh, now, Tavit Donoyan is mo more interesting because Tavit Donoyan served as a first Deputy Defense Minister of Armenia 
from 2010 to 2017, that is under Serge Sarkisian. Uh, I suspect he is not a kind of prominent uh, Imkai Lagan, that is a follower of Mr. Pashinyan. Uh, he is a very respected man. He is uh, one of the rare people uh, I have never heard anything negative uh, about him. And there aren't many people like that in Armenia. So all of those people, Tonoyan, the chiefs of staffs, uh, president of Artsakh, have made it clear that uh, this was uh, signing this uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, arrangement uh, you know, resulted from consultation and their own recommendations that, uh, you know, the situation was uh, lost, okay? Uh, and it is very difficult to uh, envision that all of those people are traitors, the chiefs of staffs, uh, the president of Artsakh, who has everything to lose, his native land, uh, his family, and so on, uh, okay. Uh, what remains unclear also is what was to be gained from treason. Uh, you know, what was the stake uh, in exchange for, for treason? What comes with it? I mean, you should have a reward, I guess, somewhere if you are committing uh, treason. Uh, I don't see that either. And I don't see uh, in this uh, current uh, very bad uh, situation, uh, sad situation, I don't see what uh, these uh, 17 parties are proposing. Uh, that is the resignation of Pashinyan. Nobody is eternal, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, okay, he resigned. So what's next? Uh, that's what I would like to see personally. Uh, there is a point where you have to assume responsibilities, you know, and. Uh, 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 as I say later on, I mean, this situation needs very clear analysis and uh, uh, one has to assess why things went as they went. I have no doubt about that. And as President Truman said, the buck stops here. You know, there, there, there are responsibilities when you are a leader. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, the problem is, uh, what are those parties proposing? Uh, uh, for example, should Armenia now tell uh, the Russians, just disappear, take your uh, peacekeepers, return to Ulyanovsk, we don't want you. Uh, should they say, just disappear promptly, we are restarting the war. Um, and what happens if they turn against Russia like uh, that, uh, that way? Uh, all of the ammunitions and so on that Armenia has come from Russia. Uh, so what I don't see, uh, I, I have no problem. Pashinyan resigned. Okay, individuals to me are uh, uh, are not important in history. They come and go. Uh, what is important is institutions, the state, the nation. Okay. And uh, I find it very worrisome uh, sitting here from afar and not being involved. As I said, I am a, a kind of informed observer, uh, an academic who, you know, that's my specialty, that region, including Azerbaijan. Uh, I don't like at all uh, uh, this unsettled situation in a time of massive crisis in a time of national crisis, because I have been teaching the Caucasus for more than two decades at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, this type of things in the midst of a crisis reminds me of what has happened, what happened in Georgia between 1988 and approximately 95, and in Azerbaijan during approximately the same period. Actually, one of the reasons why we won in 92, 93, 94 is uh, there was the decaying state and settled state of Azerbaijani internal politics with uh, changes in the leadership endlessly, backstabbing one another, and so on. Uh, this leads to national catastrophe in times of crisis. And I believe that. Uh, a solution has to be find, found uh, to uh, discuss what happened, 
transparently. Those same parties, actually 14 of them, uh, several weeks ago asked for the creation of some kind of uh, uh, national salvation body and so on. And in the case of 14 of those parties, those 14 parties at that time, uh, none of them was represented with even one deputy in the parliament. Uh, so uh, 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 this is uh, a little bit unclear what's going on. Uh, and uh, because of time, this is not an update. It's turning into a full uh, one hour lecture. I have reached the conclusion. Sometimes when you conclude, it is good to also uh, state what you don't know and ask questions. Uh, the first thing is, is this the final conflict? We don't know. Uh, what happens to the Karabakh issue? Uh, is it done? Uh, my sense is that it's not uh, finished. The second thing is obviously assuming that from a military point of view, this is, this is it. Uh, what about the status of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, itself with the Russian peacekeepers there? Okay. Uh, so that uh, also is unclear right now. I mentioned finally uh, the problem of communication when things went poorly. I mean, the, the public opinion was unprepared. Uh, there is also a time uh, for accountability, full accountability. Uh, I listened to somebody, I think it was yesterday night, uh, who had a good idea. I think there should be a clear uh, uh, report to the to a joint session of the parliaments of Artsakh and Armenia, uh, perhaps with representatives of those parties, 17 parties, 16 of which are not represented approximately in the parliament or something like that, or 15, I, I, it doesn't matter. Uh, that is, we need to know, uh, it's very important that uh, things become clear uh, that the chiefs of staff, you know, uh, explain what happened and that uh, confidence and legitimacy be restored. And after such a debacle, of course, it's not unusual for uh, leaders uh, to resign or to be asked to resign. And it seems to me that uh, assuming you can, you can heal the wounds, uh, one way of bringing back confidence and legitimacy in due time. I don't know when it is, in three months from now, six months, but that's the time frame I have, uh, you know, I could envision. Uh, it would be good and healthy to ask the population what it thinks in the form of uh, new, new legislative elections. And uh, if the people, uh, the Armenian people have no more confidence uh, in the current government or in the current parliamentary majority, they should express themselves. What is to be avoided to me is not accountability, it's instability that could lead also to the destruction of the state. So that's my conclusion and I will have to leave for just a minute. Lisa, you can uh, take it over, I'll be back immediately. Okay, uh, so I know you're leaving, but I'll thank you anyhow, Stepan. Um, so Stepan, thank you again for uh, giving us this thorough analysis of what is going on. Uh, so this thorough summary of the agreement that was signed and both the current fallout in Armenia and the possible effects in the region. Also, I wanna thank our viewers for joining us today. We have over 200 viewers currently on our Facebook Live. I wanna thank you all for also submitting your questions. Uh, I do wanna, however, warn you or tell you that we will not have time to ask all of the, the very interesting intelligent questions that you've posed in our 
chat. So I do want to just say thank you for submitting your questions. We will try as hard as we can uh, to get to your questions in the last 15 or 20 minutes or so of today's uh, program. So we will we will try our hardest. So Stepan, when he returns, will be answering questions for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And then we will conclude the program at that point. Uh, but again, I wanna thank you for joining us today and uh, spending the day with us as we are all very hungry for information and analysis that we can trust. It's very hard to find these kinds of programs that I, I can trust. However, I want to also plug uh, Zoravik's. Um, Zoravik has a, a site that we have created called help artsakhcard and, and it's card, C A, it's double R, C A R R D dot C O. So if you search, uh, you can look on our Facebook page for this link, but it's where we have been collecting, even to, up to today, we've been updating this site with uh, resources. Okay, so thank you. We are going to now, let's go on to our first question. So again, thank you, Stepan, for that very thorough summary. So our first question is about economics, trade, and borders. The agreement stipulated the de-blocking of all economic routes in the region. Pashinyan, in his address, mentioned that this also means the reactivation of the long abandoned rail line connecting Yerevan to Melri Kapan. Is this the case? And does this also mean a lifting of Armenia's blockade by Azerbaijan and the resumption of Armenian Azeri trade? And if we're opening a corridor from Nakhichevan to Azerbaijan, which itself, as you mentioned, is a de facto corridor between Turkey and Azerbaijan. And if the borders are opening anyway, couldn't we also have a corridor from Armenia to Russia at this point, or somehow utilize this situation, horrible as it is, to our advantage economically? What about a train through Nakhichevan to Iran? Is this realistic? And finally, what's the economic effect of signing these agreements for Armenia and for Artsakh? So I guess that's a three-part question about thinking about will the, the blockade be lifted? Since these borders are being opened, can these borders um, being opened be a boon for Armenia? What is the economic um, impact of this? And then what about that train that could possibly go all the way to Iran through possibly Nakhichevan? Uh, well, uh, there are a lot of questions here, <laughs> and uh, uh, part of the answer depends on uh, the way this conflict is settled. It is one thing to say, I open everything, uh, but do they want to carry out trade with Armenia or not? Now, the linkage with Iran is indeed uh, very important, it seems to me. Uh, will Turkey uh, allow uh, Armenian goods, you know, to be exported in a, uh, uh, in a more efficient manner through its territory? Uh, so what I am saying is basically, uh, you know, if uh, this is a genuine agreement that will be implemented uh, by the parties, including Azerbaijan, Turkey, and so on, then, of course, that will help improve the Armenian economy. If the agreement is a purely formal and, uh, you know, uh, is not uh, uh, really implemented or is uh, half-hearted, uh, that's uh, totally different. It might have a marginal benefit for the economy, but nothing like uh, it's a boon. You know, you use the word boon. Uh, uh, that is unlikely. Now, the linkage with Iran, uh, that, that's uh, uh, probably uh, in the first stage the most important thing, uh, because at least we know that Iran uh, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, is not uh, an enemy of Armenia, uh, unlike uh, the other states. Uh, so there, that, there, there could be some uh, benefits coming out of that. 
S4 linkage directly with uh, Russia. I, 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 I don't understand what that uh, question is. Uh, direct linkage with Russia would have to go through uh, Georgia, I suspect, or uh, through uh, uh, Azerbaijan and uh, uh, North Caucasus. Uh, uh, how can we demand that from, uh, from whom? From Georgia, you know, we are going to have a corridor. Uh, so that part I, I, I don't understand clearly. So in a nutshell, to sum up, uh, if the whole thing is implemented um, uh, without sabotaging or uh, half-hearted type of attitude, uh, it is likely to have uh, some uh, advantages for future economic development. Uh, if it is implemented very reluctantly or with, uh, you know, uh, 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 minimal enthusiasm, if not opposition, it's going to have a few benefits for the Armenian uh, economy. That's my answer. But again, in this case, uh, I am not at all a specialist of uh, uh, the, 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 these economic problems. Uh, I am just giving here uh, the uh, opinion, uh, uh, general opinion. Thank you for your answer uh, about what some of the possible economic impacts of the of this agreement being signed uh, might be for Armenia. And uh, now we have a few more questions. So I know we, we don't have a ton of time, so I'll uh, try to be brief here. We have a question about, and this might be a short question. So you, uh, a question from our Facebook Live a viewer. You say that a Lachin Stepanager uh, road has to be built in order to circumvent Shushi and that it will take years. But how is Stepanagir going to be supplied in the meantime? The only alternative route, the recently completed northern corridor between Armenia and Arsakh through Karbajar, Kelbajar, isn't an option, is it? Kelbajar will be gone. Uh, I mentioned the date on the map. Uh, uh, so that is finished. That, uh, that road is, uh, will be Azerbaijani territory very soon. I believe uh, I can uh, find the map again, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about that road will not be usable. So oh, then no, no, that's very simple. I believe it's on November the 20th, if I if I am not wrong, the Kelbajar thing. Uh, uh, so if that road is not an option, how is Stepanagir going to be supplied? Uh, in let me see. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, here we got the Kelbajar. Actually, it's the first area going. Zegnut Azerbaijani, the uh, 15th of November. That's uh, when is the 15th? Uh, <laughs> it's in a day and a half there. Hello? Yeah, I, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, so that, that's not going to be an option. Yeah, so there is a nice movie, uh, a nice movie. I think uh, I watched it by pure chance uh, several years ago, Gone Baby Gone. You know, it's the title, Gone Baby Gone. So uh, Kelbajar, uh, unless uh, the Armenian government uh, changes its mind or uh, the opposition comes to power and uh, 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 rejects uh, the agreement and so on. I mean, that's uh, not even in two days from now. You know, uh, Armenia is 12 hours ahead of my time and we are in the afternoon here. So it's very close, the Kelbajar by by. Yeah, it's it's scary to know. I mean, it's who knows what's gonna. Yeah, that will be given up very, very, very soon. Mm -hmm. um, that territory. So actually, speaking of the territory that is being being um, taken by Azerbaijan, being um, given back to them, apparently. Um, can you comment on the status of Armenian cultural heritage sites in those regions that are going to be returned to Azerbaijan and will be under Azerbaijan's control? Um, yeah. What will happen to them if they're located in territory currently or soon to be in Azerbaijani control? What will happen, for example, to Tadibank? Uh, uh, you, you know, there is a lengthy uh, tradition, uh, both in Turkey and uh, uh, in Azerbaijan of uh, destroying any evidence of uh, uh, Armenian presence and even more so monuments and so on of, of destruction. We know that. 
uh, we have even images of the destruction of the Julfa Armenian cemetery and so on. So it's nothing new. Uh, so it's endangered. On the other hand, to my surprise, over the past two days, uh, that has become a main uh, major issue. Uh, Russia is even asking UNESCO uh, to uh, uh, to deal with the UNESCO to deal with this issue. Uh, the Azerbaijanis have said no, we won't touch that, and so on. Uh, so it has come to public attention, which is a good thing uh, that should uh, maybe contribute to preserving some of those uh, monuments. But again, uh, I don't know what will happen to those that are clearly in Azerbaijani territories. Maybe in the short term, nothing. But uh, what will happen in 10 years from now uh, is anybody's guess. You know, I cannot answer uh, the question. So I, um, from what I can hear you say is that we have uh, a track record of destruction, cultural oh, destruction. No, 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 no. Yeah, by in in uh, Chula, especially the, that region, um, the Khachkars there and the cemetery was fully destroyed. Uh, so the cultural heritage sites in these regions are at risk from what we can tell. Oh, that's uh, obvious to me, Lisa. But uh, the, the problem is that the, this is the type of question that uh, uh, you cannot provide a definitive answer. You know, yeah. what if they don't touch them for a few years? Uh, claim they are not uh, actually. We have no reason to destroy them because uh, these are the monuments of our ancestors, the Caucasian Albanians. Mm -hmm. This is not an Armenian uh, church. It's a Caucasian Albanian church. Hmm? We've already seen that, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, and then 10 years from now, if the peacekeepers are out and so on, nobody knows what will happen, basically. So to give a clear answer, saying uh, they are going to destroy them uh, or they are going to preserve them is uh, totally irrational, because we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I agree. You're not you're you're very intelligent, Stepan, but you're not a fortune teller. So thank you exactly. for your yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for your honesty here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, I do want to just quickly return very quickly because a lot of people have mentioned on our Facebook uh, they feel a little bit anxious about how Stepan Aguer is going to be supplied as the rebuilding is going to the rebuilding efforts are going to start. Hopefully, we want to see the city rebuild. Uh, but as that city is going to be rebuilt after 44 days of being shelled, uh, how is it going to be supplied? If is that road that's currently going to go right by Shushi and going through Shushi, uh, how is that going to be passable for the rebuilding? Uh, I assume, uh, Lisa, again, I am not privy to the negotiations between Russia, uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan. Uh, but I assume since, uh, you know, a new road has to be built, uh, uh, pro probably uh, prolonging, you know, part of the Lachin Shushi road. So a kind of, how do you call it? There is a, a term. Detour. Uh, eh? Yeah, detour. Detour, yeah, a detour. So it's not the full road that will need to be built, uh, unlike the one from Nakhichevan to uh, mainland Azerbaijan. Uh, but I am quite sure in this regard that uh, there is a clear understanding that, uh, you know, uh, there will be access to Stepanagerd hmm, uh, until that road uh, is uh, completed. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I, would, I would tend to think that there is that clear understanding. Uh, that is, the, the Russians are not going to, uh, to allow uh, what is left of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is, I believe, about uh, half or a little bit more than half of what it used to be in 1988. So even about half or 30, 40 percent, something I haven't looked at every single square kilometer of the territory. Uh, so we are left with a diminished Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Eh? 
uh, but I am confident that uh, uh, the, the Stepana Geld will be, uh, uh, you, you know, will be reachable hmm? until that road is completed. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, so actually, given that you are a historian, we have a question that's about the history of uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, I do, we have a question from a viewer, and this question is, why weren't the Madrid principles accepted? What was previously discussed as options on the negotiating table? What would Armenia accept? What would Azerbaijan accept? So again, why weren't the Madrid principles accepted when they were developed? Uh, I have looked at those negotiations, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, the part that you can uh, have access to. Uh, the main issue seems to have been uh, the, the issue of the status of uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. You know, for, for our viewers or uh, for our audience, uh, the Madrid principles essentially and their modifications, there were uh, variations uh, subsequently. The Madrid principles were accepted approximately at the time when uh, Kocharian was uh, president of Armenia. And you remember that Kocharian, president, uh, the subsequent president, Serge Sarkisian and others had opposed uh, the Levon de Pedrosian uh, uh, policy of agreeing to some arrangement in the summer of 1997 that would uh, solve the Karabakh problem as a step by step process. However, when you look at the Madrid principles and the, the uh, subsequent uh, plans for a settlement. It looks very much as a step-by-step -step process. Armenia had to return, uh, Armenia, I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh had to return five of the regions it controlled, you know, around Karabakh itself. Hmm? Then uh, borders would be open and this and that, then uh, there would be the Kelbajar issue. Uh, then there would be the Lachin corridor uh, uh, diminished, uh, internationalized, and so on. And in the final stage, you reach the point where at some point uh, there would be some kind of a referendum to define the status of mountainous Karabakh. The time frame of that referendum, uh, the participants in that referendum, will Azerbaijani refugees participate in it? Is it a referendum or all of the Azerbaijanis will participate? And so all that was left undefined. Uh, there were moments where the parties came very close to uh, uh, agreeing. Actually, in one case, uh, uh, the father of the current president, had basically agreed to the arrangement. But when he returned to Azerbaijan, uh, he, he changed his mind or was forced to change his mind. Uh, so the key issue is that one. There are other issues, but I, I, I don't want to go on forever. Uh, can you imagine that if Mr. Pashinyan had agreed to, the, to this when he came to power, at the time when these opposition parties represented or unrepresented in the parliament from the very beginning, they had started the information warfare accusing him of uh, being there to sell Karabakh. Had he told, yeah, I am uh, willing to return the five regions and so on and this and that. There would have been the same uproar there is today, even worse that without even fighting, he is returning territories. Over the years, those very same people who agreed behind the scenes to this step-by-step -step arrangement, Serge Sarkisian and so on, Kocharian, their partisans uh, in public 
gave the impression to the population that we are not returning anything. They claimed these surrounding territories of Karabakh under Karabakh control. They are, uh, some of them are historically Armenian. Hmm? They are liberated territories. Public opinion uh, became convinced in Armenia that nothing, we, we don't give up anything. As a result, uh, uh, it would have been impossible for uh, Pashinyan, uh, who, who was presented from the start as a, is potentially a traitor, uh, uh, working for Soros and so on, all kinds of themes, destroying national identity because he's, uh, his partisans are going to adopt some uh, European conventions on the protection of children, on the protection of battered uh, women and so on. Okay. It would have been outright impossible. He would have co corroborated what his opponents had been saying about him from the very beginning. So it's a catch-22. Those very same people who agreed to those principles portrayed themselves as ultra patriots who won't give up giving anything to Azerbaijan. I mean, now that we see the result of this war, there are dozens of articles that come back to my mind that I read on my cell phone, on various news sites. News AM, 1.68 AM, Hrabarag AM, Panorama AM, all over the place. Bombastic interviews of people saying if Aliyev starts a war this time, we won't stop. We'll go at least up to the Kura River. Others, if he budges an inch, this time we go to Baku. So a kind of grandiose, uh, delusional frame of mind mentality spread. And you can realize when you look at the results of the war, what type of a shock it must be for a population that over the past eight, nine years has been accustomed to this type of understanding of the situation. It is not Armenians who are in Baku right now, but Azerbaijanis who are in Shushi. Uh, so I hope I have answered uh, the question. Politically, it was outright impossible for uh, uh, Pashinyan. And in general, it failed over the previous decades under Serge Sarkisian and the last year of Kocharyan uh, because of that issue of status. And because agreeing to a settlement was dangerous for both sides. A president who agrees to this, you know, can basically, his government can implode when the agreement is revealed. The same thing in Azerbaijan. That's why I believe you had that lengthy uh, status quo. And uh, uh, the West, the Minsk group people, the pseudo-European friends of Armenia and so on, came up with proclamation, this issue cannot be solved militarily. I have always thought that this issue could be solved militarily. No, we cannot solve this issue militarily. No, that's impossible. Well, uh, I differ. And we see uh, what happens. So uh, that's my answer to this question, unfortunately. Thank you for that that answer. As as you were saying, it's it was a catch twenty two uh, situation. Um, accept and be deposed. Uh, don't accept, and we see the results now. Um, so this will be our final question. Thank you for your time, uh, Stefan. So you and I are in the United States, as are a number of our viewers today. And some of our viewers are even joining us from France and Lebanon. 
And I even know that there are a few viewers today from Armenia and our hearts go out to you in these difficult times. But many of us again watching are in the diaspora. What can we do as we watch what's happening in Armenia now? What can we do here in the United States st uh, states or elsewhere in the diaspora as Ar Artsakhsis return to their bomb city? What can, can we do tell you what we can do. Uh, yeah. What can we do? What can uh, we do? Very simple because I intend that I don't know if I will give another Artsakh update. Uh, it, course, all, yeah. <laughs> it will all depend. Uh, 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 we'll decide later on, uh, Lisa, depending on how things go. Uh, but uh, one thing is very clear. Those who think they had friends in the West the US, France, uh, Europe, and so on. I just read yesterday night, actually, uh, it uh, made my, uh, it made me uh, very, uh, it made me laugh. Some statements by Mr. Borrell, the European, I don't know what of I don't know what, uh, uh, French foreign minister is, tries to talk. We had the national security advisor of the US, Mr. O'Brien, uh, when was it, 10 days ago and so on, coming up with the idea of sending Scandinavian peacekeepers there. Uh, why not Eskimos, Chukchis, you know, whatever. Hmm? They have been laughing at us. The assumption that the Armenian lobby is uh, incredibly powerful and so on, which the Turks like to spread that that idea. As there is also, the Armenian lobby is all over the place, you know, ma manipulating everything. If it were that strong, how can we explain this total uh, uh, passivity? So there is a problem for diasporan Armenians with the media, with opinion shapers. Hmm? That's one thing. The second thing, of course, there is a problem with uh, uh, political power, but that's none of my business. I am here as an academic and an individual. And I, I had the intention of uh, finishing this one, this update, because I, I was thinking it uh, might be the last one, unless there is a very significant development over the next few days, uh, with a call uh, uh, you know, Zoravik has organized many, many events uh, with uh, very interesting people. I am not talking about myself. The other ones were interesting. Uh, I have devoted a little bit of my time to these updates and other lectures. And I would ask the audience uh, in view now of the, not just the war, uh, the need to rebuild parts of Karabakh, assuming that the population returns there, the need to take care of the refugees. And remember, it's winter now in Armenia, it's coming. And in the area of Lake Sevan, for those who are there, I believe it's quite cold, hmm? colder than uh, Yerevan, if I am not wrong. So uh, I, I wanted just to say uh, uh, personally, as a minuscule little biped in the universe, I would be very appreciative uh, if uh, those who have listened to those talks, and maybe there might be one more, I don't know, uh, made a donation in honor of Zoravik to the Armenia Fund, because the needs uh, will be even more massive than they were uh two or three weeks ago now there are there are the refugees there is the rebuilding it's it's not just war effort and so on or humanitarian effort so make a donation uh in honor of zoravik to uh, the armenia fund and i think uh, diaspora armenians you know we ca cannot do many things of course if you are a doctor a surgeon and so on i mean uh uh, there are other things to do, uh, I, I am sure, but I am talking about the uh, 
general part of the population, you know, uh, that's one thing that can be done and uh, that is uh, extremely needed right now. And I know that most all Armenian Americans with very few exceptions can make that effort, you know? So that's what I wanted to uh, tell you. Thank you. Thank you for that advice, Professor Asturian Sepan. So we have come to the end of today's program and to the end of our series for now, Artsakh Updates with Professor Asturian. We'll miss our weekly sessions with you, Stepan, uh, but despite our disappointment with the trilateral agreement, we are heartened that for the moment, the fighting has stopped and Armenians are not being killed. Armenia and Artsakh are in a very precarious position right now. And in this moment of national crisis, accessing good information and intelligent analysis is important for the nation and for all Armenians to come together, strengthen and rebuild as you were talking about. So we thank you again, Professor Asturian for providing that kind of analysis and information and updating us on Artsakh for what for right now is the last time. To our viewers, I want to also say thank you for watching our Facebook live stream today or for watching the recording that will be posted on facebook.com slash Zoravik and on our Zoravik YouTube channel. So again, please share this information with everyone you know, use that card that we have, share that uh, website with everyone you know. We will sign off for today and we hope as always for the best for Nagorno-Karabakh, for Artsakh and for Armenia. Thank you and be well.